Hi, my name is Kathy Ketchum. I am an RN here at Providence. Um, I have been here for 36 years. I work on the IV team. I'm also a member of the Code and Trauma team. This is my partner. Hi, Rebecca Rose. I'm a registered respiratory therapist and I direct the pulmonary rehab program here at Providence and have been involved with our program Inside Out for the past 11, going on 11 years. Now, I started the Oregon program in 1989 um, because of Dr. Batar coming into the schools and affecting my life when I was an eighth grader. You know, he basically turned me dead in my tracks and made me realize my body was very special and that I needed to take good care of it. When my son was a sixth grader, I realized that Dr. Batar wasn't doing it anymore and that somebody needed to take up the burden of helping our community. The hospital's mission state statement is to promote health and wellness in the young and the indigent and we are just surrounded by these types of, of young people. So we started bringing the organs in in 1989 and to date seen almost 280,000 kids since we started the program. Myself alone. Rebecca has seen a bunch too. <laughs> came on board in 1999 with Kathy after seeing her at the Great American Smoke Out and um, I was just moved by the unique presentation using human organs that are very precious gifts mm -hmm. donated to our presentation to make an impact on students. Um, it was the first time I really saw the lights in their eyes of, of hearing about poor lifestyle choices and what it can actually do to your vital organs. Um, so we've been going strong now for, boy it's been, I, I want to say 11 years that I've been going uh, into the schools sharing this presentation and it's uh, it's a real gift. It's a real gift to the students and it's been a real gift in my life. What we found is kids are show me, don't tell me. And this is a touch of reality with these awesome gifts that show them if I stay on that course, this is where I'm going to go. We give them the tools to make the right choices. And so it's been a very positive program. We can't go anywhere without kids coming up and saying, oh, there they are, you know, the organ ladies. And that's what we've been called forever and a day. Um, that was the very first name I was given when I was at North Middle School in 1989. So we're going strong. The program is the Inside Out program by the hospital. They're providing it free to the school schools with grant money and our goal is to reach as many kids as we can reach in the community, change and, lives. And I think lastly for myself, we had a short interim where the hospital with different changes going on, we were not a part of the hospital and we still had that mission to go into the schools and, and speak with the kids and, and very uh, gratefully to both of us, the hospital has taken this program back and we're going strong. We get to represent this incredible tower here oh, yeah. at Providence Regional Medical Center. Um, and thank you so much to our the contributors and the support we've had with this program alone. But um, this is this is quite a moment in history to, to be a part of this this tower opening. We um, three years ago had a very special donation to our program here. A young man that lost his life here in Snohomish County, Everett High School student, passed away of an accidental drug overdose. His mother, having most of her children, six uh, children see the presentation, knew the impact. She donated the organs that were not used for transplant to support our presentation. And we honor Joey Roth um, every time we share this presentation in the school. It's, um, it's a gift that we never anticipated and it's a real privilege to have him as a part of this presentation. We're excited. This program is a gift to the community and this building is a wonderful gift. I've watched buildings go up and buildings go down in the last 36 years and this is just awesome. You know, our community can be very proud um, to have top-notch care, the very, very state-of-the-art and uh, compassion that we have, the hospital has for our sick as well. Good afternoon and welcome to the grand opening of the Symbolic Tower here at Providence Regional Medical Center in Everett. This is the program supported by the hospital known as Inside Out. And we're here to take you on a little journey today. My name is Rebecca Rose. I'm a respiratory therapist. And I'm going to start by talking a little bit about smoking. Um, I grew up in Kentucky. My father was a tobacco farmer. and. I thought there was no way I would ever smoke. I thought it was just a filthy, dirty, nasty habit. And unfortunately in college, I had a couple of girlfriends that smoked clove cigarettes. I started smoking clove cigarettes and I smoked for about 15 years. Now I teach the Stop Smoking program here at Providence Regional Medical Center. And I'll tell you, it's one of my best assets to help someone that's in, in need of, or in, has a desire to quit smoking. So I'm gonna show you first of all what healthy lung tissue would look like. You have 
two lungs, five lobes, two lungs on the left, three on the right. Your heart sets slightly to the left. Healthy set of lungs outside your body, two lobes left, three on the right. Your heart would set right there in the middle towards the left. Inside the body, if this person took a deep breath, these would inflate to double the size you're seeing here. That's healthy lung tissue. If you smoked a pack of cigarettes a day, every day for one year, this is the amount of tar that would be in your lungs in one year's time. Um, as a respiratory therapist, one of the jobs we have is we can help people breathe. We can put a scope in your airway, pull your tongue straight up, and put a breathing tube down into your airway to help you breathe better. After you've had this in your airway, we can put a trach tube into your neck, a hole in your neck, that we take you into surgery and cut, and we can, again, help people breathe when they're not breathing well enough on their own. So one cigarette to your lips is 4,000 chemicals. One cigarette is seven minutes that's taken off your lifespan. One cigarette has 43 chemicals that can cause cancer. It's interesting, when you break down how many ingredients are in a cigarette, there's cadmium, butane, battery acid, rat poison, nail polish remover. Any one of those ingredients alone could be life-threatening or make you very, very sick. Imagine that in one single burning cigarette, that's 4,000 chemicals. This little lady starts smoking at age 12. At age 72, here she is with emphysema, and she died of lung disease. The lungs start to get, the airways get torn, ripped, and destroyed. The lungs start to get very elongated. Imagine trying to breathe through this filthy, dirty mess. This is years and years of smoking. The next set of lungs, the gentleman starts smoking at age 12. Here he is at 68, and this is a combination of cigarettes, marijuana, on the lung tissue. And it's hard to imagine, even as a respiratory therapist, it's hard to imagine trying to breathe through this for all the years that this person lived. A lot of the students think people get to a certain age and die of lung disease. My patients spend 20 or 30 years of their life short of breath, in and out of the hospital. So, to give people an idea of what it feels like, we, we often hand out these little stir straws and have you breathe just through that straw to get an idea of what it's like when you're short of breath, when you're breathing through this set of lungs. Now, lung cancer, number one way to get lung cancer is smoking. This is Ben. Ben started smoking about age 14. This is Ben at age 48. He started coughing up blood. Two lobes left, three lobes on the right. There's his heart in the middle. When they did a chest x-ray, they found this little area right here on the side of his lung. They found that it was cancer. One of the ways that we can treat cancer is radiation therapy. So we take a high beam laser, point it right at that area of the lungs, and it will burn that area of the tissue of the lungs. Everything behind the lungs will also get burned. So we, we can kill the cancer in that manner, but if you can imagine taking that deep breath, you still have this area of burned lung tissue. Ben had cut down from two packs to one pack of cigarettes a day. He went back in to see his doctor for a follow-up visit, and the doctor unfortunately had bad news. There were areas of cancer in his heart. You can see little areas of cancer in Ben's heart. It had gotten into his lymphatic system, spread throughout his body, and he died in three months of the second diagnosis of cancer. Cancer is very greedy. Once it gets into the lungs, if not treated aggressively, this is a lady that died after three months of the diagnosis of cancer. Cancer takes all the oxygen, all the nutrition. Here's the poor little heart muscle down below. No oxygen, no nutrition. And it's a very slow, suffocating death. We make our patients very, very comfortable. Um, we have excellent pain medication so people don't have to struggle with end of life. When we think about smoking, I think most of us think of smoking in our lungs. Smoking affects every area of your body. This is a spinal column of a 16-year-old young man. His diagnosis was car versus wall. He hit a side of a cement wall at about 80 miles an hour, that was calculated. He was heavily intoxicated. From the lumbar area of your spine, halfway up, his spinal column is nicely intact. It's dark in color, that's good oxygen. And the vertebrae are nice and evenly spaced. You want good range of motion, good flexibility. This shows you the same area of a spinal column. This is a 72-year-old man, three pack of cigarettes a day smoker. It's kind of white in color, and that's just lack of good oxygen. The bone is brittle, the disc is bulging here, and this gentleman was probably in a lot of pain, but smoking is what caused a lot of this damage. So it kind of gives you an idea. Smoking affects every area of your body. With cigars, a lot of people think they're, they're, being a, uh, they're taking a safer route when they're smoking cigars. One average size cigar this size is three and a half packs of cigarettes. If I'm puffing on this, all the chemicals go through my gums, 
into my bloodstream, hits your heart like a ton of bricks. So that's 70 cigarettes. Even puffing on this, you can't close off your airway for the smoke to get down into the airway as well. So not a safe, safe, safer alternative. We see gum cancer, we see lip cancer. Um, it's just a different delivery for nicotine. Smokeless tobacco, little pinch between the cheek and gum for 30 minutes is the same as four cigarettes. One can of chew is 60 cigarettes. Um, if I could turn your attention to the poster on the front of the table, a young man, Sean Marcy. Sean was an Oklahoma native. He started using chew at age 12. He was given a free can of chew at a rodeo. And <clears throat> Sean used chew all the way up through high school. The first picture of Sean that you saw on the poster was one was <clears throat> right before his track season in 1983. He was voted 1983 Most Valuable Player. The second picture, <clears throat> picture you see of Sean <clears throat> was after multiple surgeries. Sean, had, his coach found that he was not making the time trials in track. He was not performing like he had been. His mother took him in to see the doctor, and they found a red area on his tongue with a little white patch in the middle of it. They did a biopsy. They lightly scraped your tongue, and they found that it was a very aggressive form of cancer. Sean went in and had one part of his tongue removed. Um, two weeks later, he's back out running track. The problem's gone. He was in the locker room one day and one of his buddies said, would you like a little chew? Sean started to use chew again. And unfortunately, he continued to use chew. He went in for a follow-up visit and the cancer had come back. The cancer continued to spread. He had a part of his jawbone removed and he went through two more major surgeries. The second picture of Sean was taken one hour before he died. And this is a young man that died because of a tobacco product. We don't talk a lot about smokeless tobacco. And again, it's just another deadly carrier, a delivery of, of the drug nicotine. And so we try to educate our young men in the schools, people that want to try to stop smoking. Um, we have great programs here at the hospital. This guy, Robert, was recruited by three colleges to play baseball. He started coughing up blood. When they did a CT scan, a very intensified x-ray, they found this large tumor in the back of his trachea, almost completely blocking his airway. This is an area they could not safely surgically operate. This young man died in six months of that diagnosis of cancer. He never got to live out a college dream to play baseball. And so again, tobacco smoking is one of our number one risk factors for heart disease, lung disease. Um, this is a deadly drug that we deal with throughout our hospital setting. Marijuana, you know, marijuana is, um, very controversial issue now. We have a lot of people that do have a privilege of getting a medical marijuana card. And we, you know, anything you smoke, I guess the important point I want to make are some of the medical points associated with marijuana. Um, we have excellent pain medication. We have pain patch, we have pain pills. We have different deliveries for pain meds. Um, anything I smoke, including marijuana, I'm going to cause lung damage. One of the biggest problems we have with marijuana that we see throughout our hospital setting is the way people smoke marijuana. With a cigarette, people take a breath and they blow it out. With marijuana, people take a breath and they'll hold that breath. Just like I teach my patients to use their inhaler and take a deep breath and hold it, that's how people tend to smoke marijuana. And they'll hold that breath and all the 400 chemicals in one joint get down very deep into the lung tissue. We'll see an earlier onset of emphysema, which is lung disease, uh, damaging lung uh, tissue because of holding that breath and those chemicals getting down so distally into the lungs. Marijuana has up to 10% of the drug THC. Years ago, there was five to 6% found in marijuana. Now we have up to 10% in the drug, in, in the plant. One of the areas of the brain that it affects, and I'll come down here and grab the brain, but the top area of your brain, your cerebral cortex, and throughout your brain, you have all these little receptor sites. Marijuana locks into different areas of the brain, motivational center, short-term memory center. Um, we, we have found that it can completely knock out the short-term memory. People that have smoked weed many years back, 10 to 20 years back, complained of memory loss. Today, we see people can completely lose that short-term memory. <clears throat> I had a young lady at, at, in Seattle at Garfield High School. She wanted to go into ROTC after graduation. And she said to me, Rebecca, I can study one hour or I can study six hours. I'll get a test in the morning and my mind is completely blank. And, and that's that short-term recall that we see. She said, my dad lets me smoke marijuana with him and I've been smoking it for about five years. Motivational centers. 
Whatever age people start to smoke marijuana is the age they stop the continuum of growing in maturity, interaction, and relationships. And so, although there is an ability to get uh, marijuana to help with relief of pain, to help with medical issues, it's typically a patient that is terminal, meaning a, a condition where they're not going to, going to live long. Um, we don't want to cause lung damage in any of our patients, and we're hoping that you know, people will make the right choice for their health. Uh, marijuana has also been identified to have trace amounts of anabolic steroids. Plants used to be so tall, now the plants grow much larger and faster. And they've identified trace amounts of anabolic steroids, and that's the reason behind that. We have young men that come into our clinics with testicles the size of quarters and nickels that cannot bother children. This has been linked to marijuana. And you know, kids in schools will often laugh at this. Um, you know, it's an embarrassing topic for a lot of people, but my point is when you get to be in your 20s and 30s and you meet the person of your dreams, you'd like to have an intimate relationship, start a family after you're married, um, sometimes that is not a possibility because of the damage to the reproductive system. So I always try to impress upon the students, educate yourselves, look at the facts, don't look at the, the rumors, but look at the actual medical facts and the medical-based studies uh, when you put anything into your body. Once it passes the lips or the skin, your body's got to do something with it. Now, the heart is a muscle. Your heart should be about the size of one fist wrapped around the other. The main vessel in your heart is your aorta, and it's about the size of your thumb. If I took these two funnels, it's a great example. This were your aorta. If I smoked a cigarette, that vessel would go down to here. We call it vasoconstriction for two hours. So a gallon of blood can run through here, the same amount of blood trying to run through here. What happens is the heart rate speeds up to try to push that blood through faster. And so like any other muscle, the heart can start to become enlarged. And we don't want an enlarged heart. It's a big, boggy, inefficient muscle. And so a healthy heart, this would be the healthy heart of a full-grown man. And again, the heart sits slightly to the, to the left of your chest, and that is the main vessel in the heart, the aorta. If I were to cut that main vessel open, this is the way we would want it to look, smooth and sleek like a rubber band. That's what we strive for with our patients. This is the aorta of a smoker's heart. What you're seeing along this vessel wall is cholesterol and plaque, and as you can see, it's very jagged. We call that unstable plaque. What we try to get our patients to do is stop smoking if you smoke. We give them all the assistance that we can give them. We try to get them to exercise and eat healthier. That's the way to get rid of this cholesterol and plaque, to stabilize it. And then sometimes it will take medication. If this breaks off and, and floats through my body and clogs any vessel in my body, I can have a major stroke to the brain. So we try to get that stabilized. That's cholesterol and plaque. This gives you an idea. This is, this is congestive heart failure. The heart's very large, kind of a big, boggy heart. And honestly, most of the students will ask me if this is a cow's heart. It's such a large organ. This is the healthy heart. This is the way it should look. This is the heart of someone that has spent years smoking, no exercise, very poor diet. And so the heart muscle constantly working harder gets to be very enlarged. Inside this heart, we've got a $30,000 heart valve. And you know, the kids laugh because they'll say, it looks like an animal's heart, a big cow's heart, but we don't give cows $60,000 or $30,000 heart valves. <laughs> so that's very inefficient. A large heart is not an efficient heart. If you can imagine this setting in your chest wall. The left side of your heart we call the workhorse. And this is a, a beautiful example. This is a young man that was 14 years old. He was at home with his friend and he was showing off dad's gun. And we always tell the students, rule of thumb, you see a gun, you run. You never want to take that chance. These are the kind of freak accidents that we, that are devastating to families and to us in the emergency room. The left side of the heart contracts and pumps the blood through your entire body. So it's the workhorse of the heart. At the very same millisecond, the bullet had asked the young man firing the gun, didn't realize there was one bullet in that gun. The very same millisecond, that bullet came through the left side of the heart, the heart contracted, with all that force, and instead of the bullet exiting the body, it lodged up in the right side of the heart. This young man bled out and died in his best friend's arms in about three minutes. So we always tell students, if you see a gun, you run. You don't want to ever take that chance. A very unique situation you see with this heart. It's about a one in a billion chance you would ever see this. When we work in trauma, we see a tiny entrance with a gunshot wound, explosive exit, and so it's a very unique heart that we have. Now, some of the intervention we do, we, we do here at, at Providence Regional Medical Center, 
Um, we have the Heart Institute here. We have one of the top cardiac programs in the country. And we can do a lot of interventions, such as a stent. Tiny little wire coil that we can put in any vessel in the body, open up that vessel to get better blood flow, better oxygen to the organs. That's about a $10,000 piece of equipment. So we can intervene when people make poor choices, but at a very high price. So we promote living the healthiest lifestyle you can live. Now I'm going to turn this over to Kathy, and she's going to talk to you a little bit about alcohol. <laughs> I get the fun part. Okay, a lot of times in the schools, the kids say, well, why is the drinking age if I can vote at 18? And so we try to come up with a visual that helps them understand what alcohol does to the inside of the body. Let's look at a comparison here first. Um, this is vodka, and I use this. This works in beer and wine also. But I use vodka because you can see through it. We dropped a raw egg in vodka. The yolk does not cook. The white part of the egg cooks. The white part of an egg is more immature protein than the yolk is. The yolk is actually more mature protein. The white part of the egg is a little easier to simulate what your brain and liver are like until you're at roughly 21 up to 25 years of age. So it gives the kids an idea that, okay, if I drop this in my body, I'm going to have a consequence. The younger you are when you start drinking, the more damage you do. We found that if teenagers start drinking under the age of 15, they have a five times greater chance of having long-term alcohol problems. Now, to give the kids a comparison, if I pour one shot of this vodka, this tiny little cup here, equals this can of beer, equals this glass of wine. All three of them equal each other, and all three of them take my liver one hour to clear. So I'm a kid at a party, I want to get real talkative. I chug four or five of these down. I have four or five hours for my liver to clear it. Now there is something called binge drinking. We've had young people die from that. We had a young fellow, his older brother was babysitting him and thought it would be funny to get him drunk while parents were gone for the weekend. So buddies came over, they got in the liquor cabinet. They bet this young man 20 bucks he couldn't drink a half a bottle of something. A half a bottle of this is 15 to 20 beers. That's 50 to 20 glasses of wine. That young man did die. His brother is up for manslaughter charges. I don't know where that's going. The parents have basically lost both kids. Um, let's go onward. Oh, we had a young girl, two drinks, empty stomach, barely survived. She was a little tiny girl with a small, small body mass, um, low blood pressure, low blood glucose. Um, she had an empty stomach. So we're trying to teach kids. I read an article recently in the Herald that said most young people think that drinking five, six drinks a day is okay. That is not okay. That's going to take your liver down. So let's look through some of these things. Now, your liver is the powerhouse of your body. It's about three pounds. Um, it has several different lobes. It breaks your food down. It, fights, it produces cells that fight infection. It gets rid of your red blood cells so you don't turn jaundice. It does amazing things, but it can take a beating. And one of the key things that it can take a beating from is drugs and alcohol. Uh, normal liver, I said, is about three pounds. This is actually normal liver here. It sits in the right quadrant. Okay, this one's a little hard because it's been in preservatives. This one here has got cancer. Now, you dump high chemicals in there, drugs, alcohol, different things, the liver takes a beating. And the liver doesn't like that. So, let's describe somebody with cirrhosis of the liver. Their gut's out to here, looking like they're having triplets. Their skin and bones everywhere else because they're starving to death because they can't find infection. Their weeping fluid's off, so they have to tap and do uh, some fluid drainage every couple weeks. Uh, they're bright yellow, and oh, by the way, they're 26 years old. They were drinking, the last person we had was drinking half a bottle of something a day. A half a bottle of this, 15 to 20 beers a day. So it is better for an adult to say have a drink every evening with their meal than to slam that six pack on the weekend. This one here is a drug addict. Now when you put drugs in your body, and, and this is something we caution kids, drugs don't just mean illegal drugs. If you're taking prescriptive drugs that don't belong to you inappropriately, if you are taking Oh, over-the-counter drugs. We've had girls taking eight to ten cold capsules by the handfuls at a time. That's part of the reason they have to sign out for more than one box of, of pills, cold capsules, because these girls were taking this to lose weight. They are taking their livers out. And so we're cautioning kids, just because you can buy something over-the-counter doesn't mean you take it inappropriately. You take it as it's prescribed. This is actually a drug addict's liver. It's got little balls all over it. The better picture would be like this. And this is hard to see in the back, but this is a slice of liver. It's got little round balls of connective tissue all over it. The body has battles. Street drugs, filthy. You inject street drugs, your whole body takes a beating. Um, you deposit stuff all over. This is a slice of an alcoholic liver. It looks like a hockey puck. Um, now, 
Let's look at the brain here. The brain takes a beating from drugs and alcohol. The front part of the brain is cause and effect. No, I'm not drunk, I can drive. No, I'm not stoned, I can drive. In one year, we had 38,000 seniors in car accidents driving stoned. So eventually they will make marijuana legal. When they do, it's gonna be like having drunk drivers out there. Now, liver looks like red, or it actually probably the best way to describe um, a, a, a brain, I'm gonna go into the brain now, is it looks like thick, sticky pudding. Um, usually when we get a new brain, they have to set it for a while because we can't hold it, okay? Meth, meth is very popular right now. We have a lot of patients coming in that are messed up on meth. Meth turns your liver into a furnace, so you're eating yourself alive, your skin and bones. Um, you'll go for days without sleeping, and then you crash and burn. Um, they might sleep for three days. Um, people that are on meth, they get a psychosis. They feel like bugs are crawling under their skin. We had one guy burn himself 68 times trying to get at the bugs under his skin. They'll cut themselves. They'll scratch. They'll dig. Um, there's a poster down front with the faces of meth that shows several different people, four people. The second guy down has got scabs all over his face because he's been picking and digging at the bugs. We had a young man that lived at our house, uh, my folks' house, actually, apartment. And he'd been off meth for three years. We got a phone call, come check Matt. Something's wrong with Matt. Matt was hunkered down in the closet screaming that there were bugs all over his skin. You can go back into that mode. You're feeling like you've got things crawling. We may have a patient come in strung out on meth, and we might need in the emergency room five, six, seven guys to hold them down, and they're all of 89 pounds. Um, there's always hope. Um, in the schools, we show pictures of kids that have gotten through meth use. Um, meth does cause holes in the brain. This is a normal slice of brain cut crosswise. Gray matter is the outside white matter. Well, the brain is about four to five pounds in an adult. You always hold a baby's head because the brain is the heaviest organ, and until that neck muscles, those neck muscles can support the brain, they can't hold their own head up. They'll break their neck, literally, a baby will. So we want to support the brain. Very heavy, very solid mass. This is a meth brain. We haven't had this very long, and it's pretty graphic if you just look at it up close. It looks like Swiss cheese. Sometimes these will be full of pus pockets because abscesses have gone from the body to the brain. They might see down to the heart valves. They get vegetation on the heart valves from using meth and heroin. Um, I had a boy over in Woodby Island say to me, Kathy, will you look at my arm? 17-year-old, I said, what's wrong? He says, well, I'm a heroin user. I got kicked out. I, got, I had to go to treatment. I got to come back. He says, I started using meth again. You tell the kids, you choose your friends wisely. Your friends bring you up to their level. They pull you down. Your friends are your future. Um, this young man got back with his friends. He got back on heroin. That morning when he got up, he had pus pockets all over his body. So he had his friend cut them before he came to school. He pulled his sleeve up, and I went, okay, we need a school nurse. Um, we had the school nurse take him with his parents to the hospital. We had them bleach out all the rooms that he had been in because the word MRSA, a lot of times this is MRSA. And it comes from outside the hospital to the inside of the hospital. So meth, heroin, those things, we see a lot of MRSA with from people picking and digging, injecting, and doing all kinds of stuff. Now, your brain is the size of your two fists put together, okay? And I always tell the boys, your fists are bigger than us girls. You don't get more brain cells. You have fatter cells in your head. Because <laughs> we all get about 80 billion cells. <laughs> Einstein, they say, used about 10% of his brain. We use about four to six. So not much, but a whole lot, but not much. And halfway back, Einstein donated his brain to science. Halfway down, his brain has no division. It's one sphere. If you saw the movie Rain Man, the real Rain Man didn't have a division between his right and left hemisphere. So Einstein couldn't tie his own shoes, get himself back and forth to university, but he was the smartest man on earth. Now, this is a new brain we just got, and I'm tickled pink about this because it's very hard. They usually send us dissected brains. This is an adult male. Let me turn it around here and get it in place. This is an awesome organ. It had to be set. It usually has a cap around it called the Dura Mater. Then you have the right and left hemisphere. Here's cause and effect. No, I'm not drunk. I can drive. I'm not stoned. I can drive. Then it pops down to the optics. Let me spin it around here. Optics, pons, medulla obligata. And I always tell the kids like the water boys right there. Here's the brain stem. What fragile little bugger. You need to be wearing your seatbelt, wear your helmets, wear your safety gear, follow your coaches. And this is the cerebellum, equilibrium, balance, coordination, and breathing. Drugs and alcohol. What does alcohol do? First thing you start doing, you start vomiting. You get too much of it. That's the brain saying, get rid of the alcohol. It's trying to get rid of what it can get rid of. All it can get rid of is what's in the gut. Next thing you do with too much alcohol, you may pass out. That is the way your body slows down the absorption in your body. 
If you ever see anybody pass out from alcohol, get them on their side. Because people that pass out may vomit after they pass out. Last thing to which alcohol does, you stop breathing. Well, it's taken the cerebellum up and you stop your breathing process. You need to have CPR started within about seven to eight minutes. Otherwise, your brain starts to die at that point. Now, this is an awesome organ that's been donated to us. We have all these gifts on the table.